Hello and welcome to uh, a very special interview with the Right Honourable um, Stephen Timms, who is uh, currently Member of Parliament for East Ham and the Shadow Minister for Employment and also the Labour's Vice Chair for Faiths Groups. Um, Stephen, it, it's a real pleasure to have you on the programme. I think Thank we, you, very pleased to be here. When we last had you on our programme, it was for election special and uh, that, that was very interesting to get each particular party's perspective on the forthcoming general election. I enjoyed election. it. We were all put through our pieces. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, it's just you and Good I today. Um, uh, thank you so much for giving up your, t you know, your very time and your very, very busy schedule thank you. Uh, to be with us here today. Um, you, uh, you have an extremely impressive um, CV. Uh, you know, you're a minister in the last uh, Labour government. Uh, now you're the shadow employment minister. Um, I'm sure I'm personally very interested, I know our viewers will be, about how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that goes back to my teenage years. Um, I'm not from a Christian family. My parents oh. weren't uh, Christians. But when I was at school, I started going along to the local Crusaders group, uh, now called Urban Saints. And through my participation in that group, I and also my younger brother, both became Christians. That was, I guess, when I was 15 or, or 16, I think on a, a Crusaders camp one, wow. one summer was when I, I made a commitment. Um, and since that commitment, I've seen my convictions, my belief in Jesus as the starting point of who I am and, and what I do and, and how I want to spend my life. Um, I spent, having become a, a Christian in my, my teens, I spent a lot of time in my Christian union as a, a student. And then th really through Christian union uh, commitments went to live in East London when I graduated. That's where I still live today and um, where I became 16 years ago now the, the local Member of Parliament. Uh, excellent. Um, so how has um, your faith uh, shaped your views on politics uh, and when did you decide that you wanted a career in, in, in politics? I'm not sure I ever decided that I wanted a career in, in, in politics. I, what happened was when I was a student uh, we took part in our Christian Union group mm. in a mission in East London in 1976, a very long time ago indeed, one summer. And it was the first time I'd ever been anywhere like the East End of London. It was a bit of a, an eye-opener to me to find out what the place was like. We were there for two weeks. We had a, a marquee, a, a tent mission, mm. uh, up on Wanstead Flats in Forest Gate and spent a lot of time knocking on people's doors, inviting them to meetings, holding meetings in the evening. We slept on the floor, I remember, of the, the church in uh, Bignald Road, Forest Gate. And we had a great fortnight for me. It was a wonderful two weeks. And I think at the end of that period, I felt I could understand for the first time how what I believe could really shape the direction of my life. Uh, my wife was also taking part in that mission, now wife, I didn't know her at the time. She was a, a member of the, the full-time team that uh, was the, the colonel of that mission and uh, a few years after that we, we got married. But I, so I, it was after that mission that I decided I wanted to go and live in East London. Um, I, I got a job I eventually in, in London when I graduated, so I needed somewhere in, in London yeah. to live and decided that the place where that mission had been held was the place I would make my home. 
I joined the church, which by that time the mission team had planted that was, that was new. And I'm still a member of that church 30 something years That's later amazing. on today. But having gone to live in the area, I'd always been a supporter of the Labour Party. I'd always believed it was important politically to work to make things better, particularly for those who are not very well off. And wanting to get involved in the life of the local community, I joined the Labour Party. I hadn't done anything politically active at all prior to that. I hadn't been involved in student politics at all. Uh, but I joined the, the Labour Party and very quickly was asked to take on various positions of, of responsibility in the party as the local branch secretary and then the constituency oh. secretary and eventually as a council candidate. I was elected a member of Newham Council in 1984. In 1990 I became the leader of the, the council, did that job for four years and towards the end of that period, the then Labour MP for our area died suddenly and unexpectedly he had a heart, a heart attack. As the leader of the council I was in a good position to be selected to fight the seat for Labour. We had a by-election in June of 1994. I was elected uh, the MP and that's a position I've held now for nearly 17 years. Wow, that's, that's incredible. You also described yourself as a Christian socialist. Um, firstly, what, what is a Christian socialist and what is the historical impact that uh, Christians have had on shaping the values and beliefs within the Parliamentary Labour Party? Well, the term Christian socialism goes back to about 1850 and it was one of the uh, strands of thinking and conviction which led to the creation of the Labour Party at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the, the 20th. And if you look at the first group of Labour MPs who were elected, that was in uh, the first big group was, uh, was 1906. Keir Hardy uh, was the very first Labour MP. He was elected for a Newham constituency uh, in West Ham rather than East Ham where I am, but uh, that was in 18. 92, and he was somebody who was very clear that it was his belief in Jesus Christ that was the starting point for his politics. And that was also the position of most of the early Labour MPs who were elected. They were all, uh, I think, non-conformists from very strong chapel church uh, c c commitments. Mm. For them, that was the beginning of their politics. Now, uh, of course, there were lots of other strands of thinking that uh, merged into the Labour Party as well. But the Christian Socialist Movement, mm -hmm. as it now is, was established in about 1960, so 50 years uh, ago. In fact, we had a, a reception at the Labour Party conference in September to mark the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Christian Socialist Movement. Ed Miliband, just elected then oh. as Labour leader, came along to the uh, reception to acknowledge the, the work and the importance of the, the Christian Socialist Movement. And essentially, you know, it's Christian socialism uh, is uh, a, a, a conviction coming from the teaching and life of Jesus that politics should first and foremost be about the position of those who are the least well off, those who are poor, the poor in spirit, the, the poor that Jesus spoke about. The concern for them should be the cornerstone of politics. And that's the conviction that the Christian Socialist Movement continues to bring to its witness in the Labour Party today. Uh, what role does the um, Christian Socialist Movement play now and how influential is it within the Parliamentary Labour Party? It's uh, the, the Christian Socialist Movement is formally affiliated to the Labour Party. That means it sends delegates to the Labour Party conference every year, along with trade union delegates and with constituency delegates. There are CSM mm. delegates there as well. There is a large number of Labour MPs who are members of uh, CSM. Andy Flanagan is the uh, General Secretary of the Christian Socialist Movement and is doing a fantastic job building the influence of uh, CSM. There certainly have been periods in the history of the Labour Party when the 
the voice of Christian socialism was a rather muted one and a, perhaps a relatively minor one uh, in the work of the, the party. I'm very encouraged by the way that I think we are today seeing Christians with uh, uh, increasing influence um, in the party and of course it is the case that we've, uh, up until uh, Ed Miliband, who's not a, a, a believer, but um, we had three party leaders who were all members of CSM, all of them people who saw Christian faith as a, the starting point for their politics. John Smith, yes. who was leader when I first became an MP, Tony Blair, and then Gordon Brown. So, you know, I think there is every opportunity for Christians who are sympathetic to the aims of the Labour Party to get involved, get stuck in and be influential. I hope we are going to see a, an increasing influence in the party on the part of Christians. Um, what was it like to serve as a, a minister under the premiership of Tony Blair, the most successful uh, leader in Labour's history? And do you believe that the controversial war in Iraq um, tainted Tony Blair's legacy and that of the Labour Party? Well, it, it was, of course, a huge privilege to be a, a minister in that government. Um, as you say, Tony was by far the most successful, electorally, the most successful leader the party's ever had. If you look back the, over the whole 100-plus year history of the Labour Party, we've never had more than six years in a row in, in government. Uh, under Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown, we were in government for 13 years. So it was a hugely, electorally, hugely mm. successful period for Labour and a, a, a massive privilege for people like me and, and others to be able to serve as ministers for such a long period, 12, 12 years in, in, in my case. It was hugely hard work. It was go, go, go the whole time. The pressure was intense the whole time. But I, I loved doing it. And um, it was the greatest privilege of, of my life to be able to serve for that period as a, a minister in a Labour government in a, a, quite a, a wide variety of usually economic, but sometimes other roles as, as well. The Iraq war was obviously a defining decision in the life of that government. It was certainly, for me, the hardest decision that had to be made in those 13 years, whether or not to vote in favour of military action in Iraq. Uh, in the end, I did uh, vote in favour of military action. Uh, and that is certainly, and I think will always, colour the way in which that government is perceived. And arguments continue about whether it was the right decision or or not, certainly some of the views that were put to us turned out to be untrue. Uh, we believed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It turned out that there weren't. It's still, to me, a bit of a puzzle why Saddam Hussein did not, as the UN hmm. instructed, open up his sites to full inspection. Uh, if he had done, then it would have then been discovered that there were no such weapons and there would have been no military action. He refused to open those sites up uh, and th the result obviously is, is, is history. But certainly that decision will colour the way that government uh, is, is seen uh, forever. Uh, it's very important, I think, that other lots of other things yes. that were achieved in that period are... Uh, seen as well. The fact, for example, that we got more people into work in the UK under that Labour government than has ever been done at any time in our history. The fact that we had such a long period of economic stability mm. at the end of it, of course, the crisis. But it was an unprecedentedly long period. And all of us who lived through that period, I think, have benefited as a result. So there were massive achievements uh, by that government and I, I think over time the scale of that Labour government's achievements will become clearer uh, as well but uh, I Iraq is certainly always, going, that decision is always going to be associated with the legacy of Tony Blair and of our government.
Well, as an MP and also as a former government minister, um, have you ever faced uh, persecution or been ridiculed because of your faith? Um, because the, later le the leadership within the Labour Party, certainly to coin the exp uh, expression from Alastair Campbell, was that we don't do God. So how could you incorporate with the, the idea of the, uh, keeping anything about God out of the public life on the one hand and then also having your own personal faith as well? Was there a conflict of interest there? Well, I've never experienced uh, a conflict of that kind. And of course, as I've said, the entire period up until last September that I've been a Labour MP, we have had a party leader who described themselves as a, a Christian. So uh, there's never been any difficulty for, for me uh, in being both a Christian and uh, a Labour MP. Now, as you say, Alistair Campbell famously said, uh, we don't do God. Tony Blair did not say that, and Tony Blair very often did, in fact, speak mm. about his faith. Um, uh, he, he did that when he was uh, Prime Minister. He did that before he was Prime Minister. I remember a wonderful interview that he gave just before the 1997 election, where he talked very clearly at, uh, I think it was in Easter 1997, just before the general election that Labour won in, in that year, about how what he believed influenced his politics and the way he set about his, his job as a, as a party leader. So I, I wouldn't say it is inconceivable that mm. one might face uh, ridicule, criticism, and hey, perhaps I have, perhaps people have, uh, you know, uh, raise their eyebrows at some of the things I've done or, or said, but if they have, I've never been aware of it, and I, I certainly haven't been conscious of um, being disadvantaged in in any way. But I wouldn't rule it out, and you know, if it was to happen, it happens to other people as well in all sorts of uh, walks of, of life. It's one of those things. Yeah. And what was it like to serve under Gordon Brown uh, as uh, Prime Minister? And what kind of man was Gordon Brown? I mean, he's often misportrayed a lot, a lot of people say and wasn't as media savvy as, as Tony Blair was. No, that's certainly true. Um, but of course I worked very closely with Gordon before he became Prime Minister. I became a Treasury Minister working for Gordon first of all in 1999. Uh, I was Financial Secretary. I became Financial Secretary twice more after that and I was also Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, a cabinet minister, but also reporting to Gordon as then chancellor. So I, I worked very closely with him. And for me, Gordon uh, is entitled to a great deal of credit for some of the most important achievements of the Labour the government. Take, for example, the response that the government made to the Jubilee 2000 mm. campaign. When I was a Treasury minister at the time, we were inundated with calls from churches, from Christians, to cancel the debts of the poorest countries in the world on the model of the Jubilee set out in Leviticus in the Old Testament. And I, it's down to Gordon that the government, uh, the Labour government uh, at the time, was able to accede to those demands and to cease to collect the debts that were due to us from the poorest countries in the world, from the millennium, from 2000, uh, in response to the Jubilee 2000 campaign. Now, that was followed by the Make Poverty History campaign. Yes. Uh, now, Make Poverty History wasn't explicitly a church-based campaign in the way that perhaps mm. Jubilee 2000, with the use of the Old Testament language, more clearly was. But the fact is, and I was in touch with uh, some of the people who were organising camp that campaign. The fact is, it was overwhelmingly people in the churches who were providing the energy and the enthusiasm, mm. people who were turning up and forming human chains. 80% of them, or, 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 or typically, were from the churches. A very strongly church-based campaign, uh, based in the conviction uh, and teaching of the Bible uh, about how to respond to poverty in the world. Uh, the Glen Eagles Summit of the G8 in uh, 2005 was a very important turning point, I think, in, in world history when all the big economies in the world, their leaders said, yep, we are going to seek to make poverty history. That was done under UK leadership 
uh, chairmanship of Tony Blair with Gordon Brown being a, a big influence on it as well. And it was in response to the churches, mainly the churches in the UK, but churches around the world who got behind that call. So uh, I very much enjoyed working for Gordon because I, I found in him somebody with the moral passion to turn some of those deep Christian convictions into practical policies that made a difference uh, in the uh, poorest countries in, in the world and uh, millions and millions of people in the developing world are better off today as, as a result. There were other things that uh, we worked on together in the, the, the Treasury, but I very much appreciated uh, Gordon's moral passion as a Chancellor uh, which I think has made the world a, a, a better place. I worked with him less closely when he was Prime Minister because he was you know, in number 10 Downing Street and I was um, uh, a minister in uh, three government departments while he was there, laterally again in the, the Treasury. But I do think Gordon is entitled to a great deal of credit for the response that he led to the financial crisis when that hit in uh, late 2008 and subsequently, and at a time when the US really mm. seemed to be paralyzed, not knowing how to respond, it was Gordon leading the UK government that came up with a response to the banking crisis in the UK, which was then picked up and broadly replicated in the US and other developed economies uh, as well. And I think when people look back on Gordon's time as a Prime Minister, a time when much of which he wasn't very popular in the opinion polls, I think people will see that the response that he led to the worldwide economic crisis was the right one and was one that averted very, very, very damaging consequences which would have uh, affected us very badly mm. and affected tens of millions yeah. of people around the world. What would have been the, um, I mean, having, having read a little bit about the financial crisis um, around 2008 when we had the, the major banks started to collapse, um, what were the implications of doing nothing? Because I, I read that uh, Gordon Brown was very much a student of history. He looked back at the depression of the 1930s where the US government didn't get involved in bailing out some of the institutions which led to the Great Depression. I mean, what, what part does history play and, and what would have the factors been had uh, Gordon Brown not got involved in, in stabilising the banks? Well, I think, I think you're right. I think Gordon learned the lessons very effectively from his previous studies of uh, the, the, the Great Depression and economic crises of the past. And I think there is no doubt. If government had held back again in uh, 2008, 2009, as had uh, happened, particularly in the US in the 1930s, we would have seen the world in a Great Depression again. We would have seen millions of jobs being lost around the world. Uh, a catastrophic impact on our economy, mm. on developed economies um, elsewhere in the world, and right across the world. One of the things that I did was um, working with uh, Gordon uh, on the, the G20 summit that we held in London under Gordon's chairmanship in April of 2009 and he asked me to visit a number of countries around the world in the lead up, the lead up yeah. to that summit. I went for example to Argentina and they said to me that when the, the crisis first hit they believed as a an economy that didn't have a big financial uh, sector, that they were going to be largely immune from mm. the effects of what was happening in the developed world. And then suddenly, I think it was in, in November of 2008, they discovered that their exports had fallen by 40% over yeah. the course of a, a month. And they discovered they were not at all decoupled, in fact, from what was happening they were being hit just like everybody else. So the, the, the consequences, if government had not acted as it did, would have been absolutely catastrophic, I think, in every part mm. of the world. And I, I think we owe Gordon Brown, in particular, a great debt for steering us successfully through those difficulties. Of course, we still have an economic problem to deal with. Is the legacy of the crisis that now has to be addressed and there are cuts in public spending 
that, uh, that are being made. I think too many are being made at the moment, but there's no question whoever had been elected at the election last year, uh, cuts would have been necessary. But the scale of the difficulties we now face, I think, are a, an order of magnitude less than they would have been had those oh. crucial decisions not been made in, in late 2008, early 2009, in the G20 summit in, in April of 2009. I go on to the subject of economics. I mean, what do you make of the current uh, euro crisis where we've seen the bailout of the Greek economy, we've seen the bailout of the Irish economy, I was on the verge of economic collapse. Now we hear that Spain, the fourth largest economy in Europe, is, is on the brink. I mean, are we witnessing the collapse of, of, of the euro? And what would be the economic implications for Britain if that were to happen? Well, First of all, what would the implications for the UK be? They would be very serious because the bulk of our export trade is with uh, Eurozone countries. It is in our interests uh, that uh, Ireland in particular, which you know, a, a very large quantity of UK goods are sold to, but other Eurozone countries as well are supported. Uh, and are able to get back on their feet uh, economically. So I support the loan that the UK made, that George Osborne yes. uh, announced to Ireland uh, for that uh, reason. It did strike me as slightly puzzling uh, that you know, a few months previously George Osborne said there was no money, we, couldn't, we, you know, we had to cancel various commitments, uh, and then it turned out actually we were in a position to extend a loan of £7 billion to, uh, to Ireland. But I, I disagreed with what George said first time rather than the second time. I think he was right about the, the loan to, uh, to Ireland. So the consequences of the collapse of the Eurozone would be very, very serious for uh, the UK. I don't myself expect it to collapse. It's clearly going through a very difficult period. Mm. And it was always clear that there are very different economies within the Eurozone. And the big problem, I was on the Treasury Select Committee before the Labour uh, election victory in, in 1997, and we looked at this question, should the UK be a participant in the Eurozone? And the, the big difficulty, and I was very sympathetic to the view that we should be uh, members of the euro, but the big difficulty was always this. If a shock affected different member economies in different ways, requiring a different response, and yet everybody was all in the, in, in the single currency, how could that be managed? And we're seeing the reality of that worry now, that the effect of the crisis on Germany has been very, very different from the effect on Greece, the effect on Spain, the effect on Ireland, and yet there can only be one interest rate across all of those uh, countries. And we can see just how problematic that's proving. So, you know, I think Gordon Brown was absolutely right uh, to keep us out of the euro. I think the problems that we would be facing now would be much greater if we were within the, uh, the Eurozone and uh, having to apply the same economic policy as everyone else in the Eurozone. But my, my sense is that despite the difficulties, yeah. the Eurozone will survive, will come through this intact. I think the political commitment across the European countries is sufficiently strong to make that happen. But it is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult for Germany, which is the, the economic powerhouse. I mean, of the is, is, is there any way, for example, that this crisis with the euro would lead to uh, a loss of sovereignty for Britain, a loss of sovereignty for European nations, and, and we're looking at more of a political union across Europe, more movements towards some of the federal ideas of creating a, a United States of Europe. Well, is that one of, one of the dangers? And, and what's your view on on that issue? Well, I think we might be looking at some greater degree of pooling of sovereignty within the Eurozone. Mm. So for, for countries like Ireland, for, for Greece, for Germany, for France, we may well find that they do pool to a greater extent than they have done so far their economic sovereignty. I don't expect us to be affected because we are not members yeah. of yeah. the Eurozone. Uh, and I, I see no likelihood now of us becoming members of the Eurozone, given the experience that uh, we've, we've seen over the last two or three uh, years. So uh, I don't expect us to be affected, 
but I, th I think it's entirely possible that there could be a greater pooling of sovereignty within the countries that are forming. And, and will the people zone. of Europe have a voice? Because one of the, one of the biggest issues we had in Europe is, is that the people haven't really been given a voice or a referendum on further European integration. While well, we're seeing a huge transfer of power due to the Lisbon Treaty from Britain to Brussels and uh, the European institutions, particularly with the formation of uh, um, an office, foreign office, a European foreign office. Um, it, it, with, with this in mind, um, is your party going to promise a, a referendum on any further European treaties? Well, uh, I mean, we, we had the debate about the referendum on the Lisbon uh, Treaty uh, and because it wasn't a new constitution, um, we took the view that there, that there shouldn't be a referendum and, and I, you know, my view is that that's right. I think the Lisbon Treaty was largely a very sensible rationalisation of uh, arrangements which were in place uh, before um, and, and so I, I don't see uh, the likelihood of a, a new referendum from now unless something major was happening in the future. But I mean I don't think there's any appetite in Europe now for further uh, large-scale change. Um, it looks as though there might be some change to the Lisbon Treaty required by this, the response to the economic crisis. Yeah. It wouldn't affect us in the UK because we're not in, in, in the Eurozone. And you know, I think it would be uh, a, a bit ludicrous to insist on a referendum for a, mm. a, a change that doesn't really affect us. Um, I mean, the government, I think, is committed to a referendum, although I suspect in the end they, they won't... They won't um, their previous commitments could be read as committing yes. them to a referendum, but I don't imagine uh, quite sensibly that in the end they will um, go for a, uh, a, a referendum. But, yeah, in, in the future, if there was to be the prospect of further large-scale change, I think uh, a, a referendum would be a appropriate. Yeah. And during the, um, last, uh, during the last election, uh, we did an election special which you were involved in. One of the biggest issues, I think the biggest issue for Christians in this country, was a growing sense of Christians feeling uh, marginalised from the political process, from public life in this country. And um, we've had uh, recent um, issues arise, such as uh, a woman not being able to wear a cross at work and others people working in the NHS not being able to pray with patients in fear of being struck off or losing their jobs. Um, you know, w w what is your view and what is the view of the uh, shadow cabinet to actually protect Christians uh, and their freedom of conscience in the workplace? Well, first of all, uh, I am a, a very, very strong supporter of Christian participation in mainstream politics, I would like to see a lot more Christians getting yeah. involved, standing for election, being local councillors, being school governors, being willing to do the work, because it's a huge amount of work, of the, the political oh. process. And if Christians are feeling marginalised, and uh, I've certainly spoken to Christians who uh, are concerned uh, about that, and I have some sympathy with some of those uh, concerns, then I would say the first response should be get involved. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to sit on the sidelines and, and, and criticise. It's much harder to make the commitment of time, of, of, of your life almost, mm. to being involved in a costly, a costly way alongside others, other Christians and lots of non-Christians, in doing the political job and and so i would say the first thing is get involved get stuck in uh, don't be uh don't be too put off by some of what you read about what politics is is like i think you know one of the the, the problems i think for a quite a long period christians did pull out from from politics and you know, well, I guess if people pulled out, it's not that surprising that yeah. they're, they're unhappy with the outcome. The, the way to change it for the better is to get stuck in. Uh, and I would want very much to encourage yeah. Christians to do that and, and to be confident that their, their, their convictions, their trust in, in God will be able to support them in uh, that work. 
and I'd want to affirm from my own experience the, yeah. the truth of, uh, of that, uh, that conviction. But, you know, uh, let's look at uh, some of the, the, the incidents that, that you've uh, referred to. I mean, I, I, I think it is absurd to suggest that somebody should lose their job for wearing a cross. Goodness knows how British Airways got themselves into such a ridiculous uh, position. There is certainly no law to defend uh, that action by an, em an employer and indeed I would hope now that we have the Equality Bill on the, the statute book uh, there will be legal protection in future when that uh, if such a situation um, arose. Uh, members of uh, the NHS, uh, employees of the NHS praying for people again that seemed to me a completely ridiculous action that was taken by the Primary Care Trust uh, in that case. Mm. Now, you know, if uh, somebody who works in the NHS uh, wished to, uh, to pray for somebody who did not wish to be prayed for, yes, yes. who did not share their beliefs, and, you know, who did, or, 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 or perhaps you know, even somebody uh, who uh, had, 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 had not uh, assented to be prayed for, then my view would be that that Christian should not impose a, a time of prayer on a, a patient who didn't didn't want it, and you know I can see that in some circumstances it could be that the action that was taken uh, was uh, could have been inappropriate. But the particular incident where it, it arose, it seemed to me there was the, the, the individual, the Christian, had done absolutely nothing wrong at all, and uh, I thought it was absurd that action was threatened against them. I mean, also we look at you know you mentioned the. Um the Equality Act that was introduced by, um, by, by your government. That is creating problems for Christians, particularly in the workplace. I mean, we've, we've got a couple who have a guest home in Cornwall who uh, now could be sued under this legislation because they didn't want to allow a homosexual couple, even though they also stated that they don't allow unmarried couples to, to, um, to, to actually enter into their hotel. And other issues affecting um, Christians who conduct marriage ceremonies for not wanting to conduct a homosexual um, ceremony because of, of their belief in the Bible. Now, how does that freedom of conscience and that right to act according to their uh, beliefs and that of government legislation? Well, I think if one wishes to work as a registrar, uh, uh, working uh, in uh, a local authority, uh, then that does involve uh, being uh, officiating at civil partnership uh, ceremonies. That is part of the job. Now, it may well be there are people who feel they can't do that, but I think they need to recognise that means they therefore are not able to do that job. I don't think that one can be in a position to say, well, I'll, I'd like this job, but I'll only do this part of it. I won't do the other part. You know, if, if people feel that their convictions mean they, 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 they cannot be a registrar, then OK, fair enough. Then. But, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it would be right or, or, frankly, fair to the local authority to, to, for somebody to say, well, I want to do this part of the job, but not that part. Uh, you know, we do have uh, civil partnership uh, legislation. Uh, I, I supported it. Um, and it, it seems to me that as part of a, a registrar's job, it's appropriate for someone who wants to take on the responsibility of being a registrar to be willing to do the whole of the job. And, and if they are not willing to do the whole of the job, then they, they shouldn't uh, seek uh, a position as a, a, a registrar. So, you know, my position, my sympathy would be with the, the local authority on that particular case. And as, as vice chair of uh, faith groups on behalf of the Labour Party, uh, one of your publications I read called The Mosque Update, there's a promotion of Islamic finance with a quote from uh, Lord Digby Jones, former minister for trade and investment, says, our goal is to position the UK as the international partner of choice for the provision of Islamic financial services. Is not Sharia financing, uh, is this not Sharia financing, and what is the implication this could have on the rest of our financial institutions? Well, Sharia finance uh, is uh, that part of the financial services market which is consistent with the beliefs of Muslims. 
and the, 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 the key feature of Sharia finance is that it doesn't involve interest. And of course, it's very interesting that you know, medieval Christendom also had a ban on interest, a ban on usury, as mm. it was uh, called. Uh, Islam has stuck with it. Christianity hasn't. Christianity has, uh, has, 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 has moved on from it. Um, but I, my view is that people who wish to, uh, to buy financial services which are uh, not based on interest yeah. should be yeah. free to do so. There should be provision in the market uh, for them. And because the UK is the, it, 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 arguably now, uh, the, the, the world centre of the financial services uh, industry. It's London versus New York. You know, on some measures, London has the lead. Then we should have a leading part in the provision of Sharia financial services as part of our leadership of the, the world market. And in fact, there are quite a lot of people in the UK who want to, to use, to buy uh, Sharia compliant financial services. So. Uh, I, I, I think Digby Jones is absolutely right. If in the UK we want to be uh, world leaders in financial services, and we do, uh, then that should extend to uh, Sharia compliant financial services um, as, as well. Perhaps I should say a little bit more about my sure, course, my, my, yeah. uh, the p party vice chair for faith, because you know people very often say you shouldn't mix faith and politics. Mm. And then if you do, you're asking for trouble. And they'll point to trouble somewhere in the world and say, well, there you are. That's what happens when you let faith and politics get mixed up and there's, there's, there's trouble. And they look to Belfast or yeah. Baghdad or uh, somewhere where you know, uh, there does indeed seem to have been uh, a, a problem. But I think it is absolutely wrong to say you shouldn't mix faith and politics. And my view actually is the opposite. My view is that faith is a very good starting point for politics. And the reason is that faith is the source of exactly the values that we need to make politics work. Responsibility, solidarity, compassion, patience, truthfulness, Tolerance, all these are values which are instilled uh, in people who believe in Jesus. And they are exactly the values that we need in our politics to make politics work. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why the Labour Party made such a huge impact when it was first uh, yeah. established, because it was people who were bringing those values into politics, perhaps for the first time who were having a, a, a very big impact. And we need renewal of those values as well. So faith is a very, very good starting point for politics. And that's really the, the central point that I want to make in my work as Labour Party vice chair for faith groups, to encourage people to come forward, to get involved, to get stuck in, as I was saying earlier, in politics, and to do so very clearly and openly from the starting point of their faith mm. convictions, not to apologise for them, not to hide them, not to preach necessarily, uh, but to be quite open about the, 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 the starting point that they bring to their political work. And for many people to do that from a starting point of faith in Jesus. And I'm very encouraged about the scale that uh, I think we are now seeing the willingness increasingly of people to, to step forward and take on political work and to take on other roles in our communities. And we are seeing now fantastic work being done, for example, on welfare to work. Some of the very, well, I was employment minister as well as yeah. currently shadow employment minister, some of the very best initiatives that I went to see helping people who have been out of work for a long time get back into work were being run by churches. The Ascend project at St Paul's Church in Hammersmith, the Pecan Project at Peckham in South London, City Gateway in East London, all of them doing fabulous work from a very clear starting point of faith in Jesus, wanting to serve their local community, serve people and enable them to get back into work. A lot of the work that's being done to help asylum seekers, refugees around the UK mm. is in fact being done by churches. Don't necessarily make a great song and dance about it, but the people who are willing to help, 
people who are destitute in practice are very often people in churches. A lot of other work, the, the, much of the best youth work right across the country being done by uh, churches. So wherever you look today, we are increasingly, and I think in a very encouraging way, seeing people in the churches willing to come forward, willing to shoulder the burdens, willing to serve their local community, make their communities much better as a result. And what I hope we'll see more and more people doing is coming uh, a step further yeah. from, on the basis of, of that involvement, saying now I want to be involved in the political decision-making uh, as, as well. And I think uh, there's a, a lot for us to look forward to as yeah. that movement gains I mean, momentum I mean, over talk, the years Talking ahead. about Christians, I mean, one of the you know, issues that is close to my heart is the issue of the persecuted church. And uh, we've seen a real increase in the persecution of Christians, particularly by uh, Islamic fundamentalists throughout the Middle East, in countries like Iraq, where we've had recent bombings against Christians in, um, in Iraq. There's the newest day attack on uh, Christians in, in Egypt. Uh, and, and this seems to be increasing. Uh, and yet, what power does the UK government have to protect uh, Christians abroad, to protect human rights, um, as it really seems that, that very little is being done to actually protect our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who face persecution, who are being killed because they believe in Jesus. Well, that protection which people in those countries are absolutely entitled to and should be receiving can only be the responsibility of their government. What the UK government can do and should do, uh, and I would certainly expect uh, William Hague as Foreign Secretary to be doing this, is to impress upon his uh, counterpart ministers in, in those countries and others the importance of protecting the, the, the rights and the freedom and the safety of, um, in those cases, religious minorities. Uh, there are also things that individual MPs can do. I mean, quite often uh, as an MP I will receive uh, letters from, from my constituents urging that I make representations perhaps on behalf of an individual, a Christian, uh, who is facing persecution uh, in uh, another country in the world. I can write to the ambassador, the UK ambassador, uh, uh, from that country. Uh, make the case to them and, and I and, and other MPs are, are always very happy to make representations of that kind. So there are things that we can do but of course ultimately it can only be the government of that country who can provide uh, the support that's required and, and I think what you know, the UK government needs to do is just to continue to press those governments to do all that, that can be done to provide uh, protection. I, you know, I think it is one of the most distressing things about what's happened in Iraq that so many Christians have fled the country yes. um, in uh, recent years because they've simply felt it wasn't safe for them any longer. In fact, we had a, um, uh, an Iraqi Christian leader in the UK not very long ago calling on other Christians in Iraq to leave because it wasn't safe. Well, that's a terrible situation yes, right. to have uh, have, have got to um, and you know I, I hope and I certainly would want the UK government to use its influence increasingly to make sure that Iraq does become a safe country for Christians as long as as, as well as others uh, Egypt um, as uh, as well I, we heard the uh, shocking news after the election and um, of uh, your stabbing by uh, Roshanra Chaudhry, who's now been sentenced to 15 years. She's described as a talented young uh, linguist who is heading for a first-class honours degree. Um, and it's come to light that she's been heavily influenced by watching YouTube videos or broadcasts of Islamic sermons by the Al-Qaeda cleric um, Anwar al-Awaki. Um, what more can be done to stop the incitement and hatred that is radicalising so many of our young British uh, Muslims in this country? Well, I, I think this is very, very pernicious stuff. And it appears, in the case of Roshnara Chowdhury, that she simply listened to this stuff uh, online, on her own. Uh, I think um, the, uh, the transcript of her interview, which was published in The Guardian, said she listened to about 100 hours of it or something, pretty heavy and intensive stuff. Uh, a very bright young woman, as you say. 
uh, on the basis of listening to that material online, decided to commit the, the crime that she uh, committed, and uh, you know she's now serving a, a life sentence in prison as a result. I was pleased that YouTube took the material down um, soon after the, the trial, but I gather it's all back up there again now, and there's, there's actually very little you can do to control uh, what appears uh, on YouTube, or if it's not on YouTube, it'll be somewhere else on, on, on the web. Um, nevertheless, I think it is helpful to do what can be done to limit access to it. I think it's very, very important uh, that Muslim parents uh, keep an eye on what their children are up to online, just as all parents need to keep an eye on, on the material that their children uh, are accessing online is. But I think, so you know, there's that side to try and limit yeah. exposure to this very, very pernicious, very, very damaging material which people um, are getting uh, hold of. Um, but uh, we need to do more, uh, 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 and I think we need to do things in a more positive way um, uh, as well. I mean, one of the interesting things for me in the response to the attack on, on me just after the general election in, in May, I had a, a, an overwhelming response, as I guess you'd, you'd expect yes. Uh, yes. from what happened. I was extremely grateful to all those people who wrote to me, who sent me emails, who sent me cards, text messages to wish me well after the attack. I was very grateful to Revelation TV for uh, asking viewers to pray for me and to all those, and I know tens of thousands of people mm. who prayed for me um, after I was attacked. Uh, I was very grateful for all that support and I'm pleased to say that I uh, have made a, a full recovery and there don't seem to be any lasting ill effects from, from what happened. But one interesting thing that also happened was I got a lot of letters and cards from Muslims who told me they were praying for me for a speedy recovery. And, you know, the, the, the vast majority of Muslims in my constituency and uh, in, in, in the UK are people who want to live peaceably in Britain, who want to make a positive contribution mm -hmm to our society and to our uh, economy. And when, you know, I said that um, I became the, uh, the MP for East Ham, became the Labour candidate after our MP in 1994 suffered a, a fatal heart attack and there was a, a by-election, the first person who came to me and said to me, we think you should stand as the candidate was the chair of the Alliance of New and Muslim Associations. And the argument he put to me was, you believe in God, we believe in God, we think you should go for this job. So I'm somebody who believes that Muslims in the UK have a very, very positive contribution mm. to make to our life, to our society, to our economy, to our communities. And it's, uh, it's often struck me that for many Muslims, they see people who are committed Christians as their closest allies because the, 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 uh, the, 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 pers the perspective that they bring is, is very much a perspective around belief in, in God. And they see Christians as being, uh, having a, a th rightly, as having a similar perspective. So, you know, I think the contribution that we can look to Muslims to make in the UK should be a very positive one. But there clearly are these very pernicious influences uh, in a contrary direction. And everybody needs to be very vigilant uh, about them. I'm, I'm optimistic about the prospects. I mean, you know, if you look at the position of the Jewish community yes. in the UK in the 1930s, in some ways, that is rather analogous, I think, to the position of the Muslim community in the UK today. Now, what happened uh, after the 1930s was that we were able to bring about a, a, a situation where the Jewish community in the UK is wholly at home, is, is, is able to make a very positive contribution to UK life in politics and business and the arts and, and, and everywhere, thanks to partly the creation so successfully of institutions which are clearly Jewish, 
but also clearly British. And I think what we need uh, in the future is the establishment of, of more and more organisations which are both clearly Muslim and also clearly British. And I hope that in that way we can bring about a, a similar uh, change and development of the position of the Muslim community in the UK to that that we've seen in the, the Jewish community, which I think now pretty well everybody would recognise is a wholly positive and, uh, and valuable one. And um, yeah, well, no, coming down to the final part of, of the interview here now, Stephen. Um, what would you? Uh, why do you believe it's important that Christians should get involved in politics? And, uh, and do you have a message for our viewers as well? Well, I want to very strongly encourage people to get in, in, involved uh, for reasons that we've already uh, talked about. But in particular, because the values that people whose starting point in life is belief in Jesus, the values that they then bring to politics are exactly the values that politics need if it is to do the job that needs to be done. And we've seen that time and time again in our history. You know, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the story of, um, of William Wilberforce, the abolition of the, the slave trade, the abolition of slavery from the UK and from the British Empire, that remains as perhaps the greatest success of parliamentary democracy in the, yeah. the UK. And it came from the, 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 the values, the commitment, the passion, not just of William Wilberforce MP, but of a whole movement of people in the churches who lined up behind him to change Britain for the better and to persuade Parliament to make the right decisions. And not just Christians, but right across the democratic spectrum, people will look now at that episode as a triumph for yeah. democracy and for freedom. We need that commitment, that passion, those values again in our democratic life. And I look forward to many Christians coming forward, being willing to do the really hard work, being willing to make sacrifices, being willing to give up time uh, give up their evenings, give up their weekends for the work that is required to change politics for the better in the future. I hope many more people will uh, come forward and, uh, and, and do that and be encouraged about the impact mm. that they can see in their community and in our country as a result. OK, I just want to um, thank you for, for watching a uh, special interview today with the Right Honourable uh, Stephen Timms, uh, uh, member of the uh, Labour Party, a former government minister, and also um, minister... Sorry, can I cut that bit? I'll work on that bit. I'll just do this one. Uh, it's this pre-record, so you find it's doing pre-record. Um, right, so I just want to thank you very much for watching today's interview with the Right Honourable Stephen Timms MP. It's been a pleasure to, to interview him today. Uh, he is a member of MP for East Ham and is Shadow Minister for the Employment. I just want to thank you very much for giving up your time to, thank you. Thank to, you for to discuss some of the vital issues that are affecting Christians today. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a pleasure thank and you. a privilege. Thank you.